core URL that is quite important for you. I want to demonstrate examples today based on this central URL, which is public, so you will have access to it. Let me just open that page. <clears throat> Here it is. That's the URL. Sorry. That's the URL. That's your central entrance towards the developer components. On the left side, you have a navigation tree. I will have some additional tabs here. I will explain in a few seconds. Once again, this is the page where you should start develop with your development process, integration process. First of all, in our development, what we have is we offer different protocols for communication with our web services. The major protocols, maybe a bit uh, <coughs> obsolete is uh, SOAP, but it's still uh, in use. Um, the, we have JSON and SOAP uh, protocols. These two protocols are equal when it comes to the scope of features they are covering. So whatever you can do with the JSON, uh, whatever parameter or method you can reach from a JSON interface is also available through SOAP and the other way around. Furthermore, we also offer REST uh, access to, to, well, where you can parameterize your method calls through a URL and what is quite new and I still have to gather uh, knowledge how to work with this is Open API. Um, <clears throat> So if you want to have more information about the open API, I recommend to have a look at the forum. Just by the way, this is our developer forum. I will come back to this several times during the session. This especially is for example, for .NET developers who want to use our services. But let me get back to the start page of the API once again and to the slides. Oops, add to the slides. So choose one out of these protocols and be aware that the REST access, the URL driven uh, parameterizing approach does not enable you to use 100% of the features. I recommend to use JSON or SOAP or the new open API. Uh, Oliver, if you want to give us some, some more details about this on audio, feel free, just unmute yourself or provide it in, in the chat maybe. I will just go on if you do not interrupt me, <clears throat> which is not a problem, by the way. So furthermore, we have two different levels of APIs. One API is called the release API or the head API, and the other one is the experimental version. Let's have a look into the browser once again. On the administration desk, uh, you see the different services. We do not have only one API or only one um, WSDL file, for example. We have a bunch of these <coughs> APIs. And here you can see that here we have an X cluster module, we have an X data module, uh, we have an X DEMA module. And if you look, for example, into the AP documentation on the left, you can see these are the available modules. And each one of those modules is the specialist for a specific kind of function. For example, all the routing related functions are part of the X route method, all the geocoding functions are part of the X locate and so on. I will come back to the documentation in a few seconds. Let's just get back to the services for a second and look, for example, into the X locate. Here we are in the X locate. You can see there is some SOAP elements, there is some JSON elements and there is some REST elements. <clears throat> Um, I will explain in detail what the REST element covers or does not cover for now. I want to get back to the difference between experimental and head. Uh, the difference is that in the experimental API, we have some more um, parameters that are not available through the head API. Um, if we look, for example, into the routing method, calculate route, routing options. <clears throat> I will explain how to read this documentation in detail uh, in a few seconds, but what you see here is there is a, a property of a, a specific class that is labeled as experimental. And experimental means it could be the case that we as product management decide that either the name of that property or the mechanism itself as a whole is, um, well, 
is, is not mature enough to be used in the release version. For example, once we deploy a new feature, we start with it as an experimental feature and after a few releases, major releases, we will perform uh, Q&A tests, <coughs> quality management tests, and then release that feature uh, in the head version of the API. Let me get back to this. So if you are curious about PTV offers in the future, feel free to use an experimental version of our developer components. If you want to pro program a production um, application, which has to be stable, even after an update of our versions on the, on the server side, <clears throat> then I recommend to use the head version. So much about this. So that's the difference between the release and the experimental. <clears throat> um, currently, on the on the system I'm I'm using for my demonstration, this system is now on level 2.20, but uh, the features are only active up to 2.19. 2.19 is the officially released version. If you are working on premise, you can download 2.19 from our services. The 2.20 is for, let's say, early adopters who want to have a look at the, the future version of the next API. So I was talking about protocols. I was talking about the differences between release and experimental. Next thing to mention is the available clients we offer for uh, you to integrate our services into an application. What we create with every version is client classes for Java, for C Sharp, and also for JavaScript. One thing that is important to mention here is that with uh, <clears throat> if, if you want to use the experimental API, you have to use specific Java experimental classes. If you want to work with the release API, you have to use the Java release version. And by the way, let me just show you on the screen <clears throat> in the developer's guide, there is a download where you can get these client classes that we provide automatically with every new release. <clears throat> so, if you want to create your own clients based on the WSDL files, for example, I can recommend the to use our xserver.net. That's a library or a collection of controls that are uh, created by Oliver, who is in the chat as well, um, that enable you to create a, let's say, desktop application. Here you can see this control. It's a regular mapping control, which enables us to display also geometries, for example, interactive geometries, uh, different kind of layers. There is some interaction I can remove, for example, or fade the route. I can paint several routes at the time. That's just a, an option for you if you want to deal with mapping interfaces. And for that, you would have to use the NuGet package manager with that statement here. There's also a sub forum that deals with it. <clears throat> for creating client classes on your own, which are covering the geocoding, the routing, or any other WSDL file, I can I am familiar with the command line tool WSDL from Visual Studio. If you are .NET developer, uh, but there's also other approaches that can use the OpenAI tools, which are described in this forum post by Oliver. <clears throat> um, what is also quite important to mention, I might repeat this several times during today's session. I said we have also a REST API where you can parameterize through URL. What is important is that the REST URLs <clears throat> do not cover 100% of the features or parameters that are available <clears throat> in the JSON or SOAP or Open API uh, approaches. <clears throat> For example, this is just when I compare the, let's say, 100% features of the JSON or SOAP interfaces with the one and only REST method that is provided by the XRoute module. You can see that many features are not available, just to mention a few of them. The original API offers about 200 routing parameters to influence where you're allowed to drive, what are the dimensions of your truck, and so on. You can specify these 200 parameters at runtime with the JSON or SOAP, 
but with the REST API, you can only refer to a so-called preset of parameters which are available on the server. So that's a clear lack of, let's say, flexibility. It's easy to integrate probably, but you do not have access to each and every feature. <clears throat> well, so much about, let's say, protocols and connectivity on a quite generic point of view. Let me just go move on with some more info. The URL I have opened in the beginning is the one on top. That is our world map, which is <clears throat> hosted in, in this case, the European Azure Center from Microsoft, and it's the test version. That means test is a, let's say, smaller <clears throat> uh, environment. The hardware that is behind the test environment is a bit smaller than the production, and production is restricted to those parties who have a license with PTV. So if you are having uh, gathered a test token, <clears throat> then you can have 60 days of development of, of tests on this environment with the test in the name, <clears throat> and then it will be, um, and then you need, uh, well, us to prolong your test phase, or you need a production token to get access to this system. If you have created an application with the protocols that are available on this upper environment, you can switch to that environment quite easily, just provide the corrected URL, the other URL, provide your new token, and then you will get access to this if you have an official production token. <clears throat> Some more info about the different environments that you could use. We have three different categories. Category number one, one the most important one nowadays is we have XServer Internet. That's the name of a product, and it stands for a standard cloud that is used by a lot of parties at the same time. It's shared. You have to authenticate yourself. You have to provide your ID, well, in, in terms of a token, and then you can access get access to that system. There is several machines behind that, on the especially on the production. <clears throat> um, once we recognize that the capacities of our uh, cloud X server internet is not sufficient, we would just add more resources over there without the need to tell to, to tell you about this, this happens in the background on a transparent level. But the important thing is, this is a shared system which is used by many parties at the same time. The second approach is a custom cloud. For some reasons, if you do not want your data to be merged in the same hardware as it is with uh, <clears throat> all the other customers, um, we can offer a custom cloud. That means our PTV administrators take care of this environment. <clears throat> and uh, perform updates if needed and it's still hosted in Microsoft Azure or in our scope. And the third version is X server on premise. For those of you, some of you might already have installed a local installation. And X server itself is a Tom Tomcat application server which has the modules in included in the in the Tomcat as standalone applications. So this is also possible on premise but what I recommend is to make sure when you start a new project, look into X server internet. I think that's becoming more and more important as the de facto standard. Do probably your administrators do not want to spend time on performing map updates or these kind of things. We do this in the background for you on the X server internet <clears throat> standard cloud. So much about the three systems. Next thing is the token. I have already mentioned this. The token is required because when you access X server internet, well, it's only required in X server internet or in the custom cloud. You do not need the token for on-premise. But if you want to access a shared system, you need to tell us who you are and this is done by the token. This is a standard basic authentication, which is based on username combined with a password. The username is the same for each and every party. It's Xtalk. And the password is the token that we have provided once you have registered for a trial period, for example. Uh, what is also important to mention, if we look into uh, these two URLs, sometimes it happens that a customer comes back to me and asks for, I have a problem, I, uh, the routing crashes, I want to calculate a route from somewhere in Europe, for example, from, from Spain to Germany, and I get an error message. And then it turns out that the system that is used by the party is not the test, is also not the production. It is what we call the dashboard version. 
and for you to know is the dashboard is well <clears throat> is only using a Luxembourg map so that's not a complete European or world map do not use the dashboard version if you want to go deeper into details of, of programming an application for example so <clears throat> next thing to mention is once again we have Azure-based systems X server internet as a standard cloud service we have the custom cloud in Azure if needed by you and if you want to install our services on premise you can just download uh, a Linux or Windows archive and uh, deploy it in your own well responsibility in your own hosting center <clears throat> okay next stop uh, the documentation so let me go into the browser once again we have seen this central page on the left side you can see different smaller applications in the administration part you can have access to well let's say some some public information on premise you would see some more elements here but in a shared cloud and i do not have additional access compared to you in this environment you can have access for example to the services we've already seen you can also also have a look at what kind of profiles are available over there the profile is an xml document that contains for example the specification of uh, how to parameterize a routing request and what is more important if we look into the tree once again is on the left side we have showcases these are small applications that draw your attention to a specific mechanism and i will come back to these showcases several times during today's uh, training let me just give you a quick introduction into the geocoding showcase on the left side we have search addresses geocoding is quite important whenever you want to perform a routing or a tour optimization or a strategic optimization you always need coordinates <clears throat> and these are mainly gathered through their postal addresses and this is why we need a feature that is called geocoding so in this geocoding showcase you can enter an address for example mordor we will look into our map database try to identify addresses that match this input string this is demonstration of a single field search so the user in a in a web uh, environment usually provides just a single text box uh, so you are familiar with that <clears throat> if you click on this um, button then we will show these hits we call them hits on the left uh, in the map if you expand it you can have access to additional information for example also for the coordinates but also how good is the matching between this hit and the input address for example <clears throat> that's geocoding one important info which is often overseen is if you click on this icon you have a structured input that's what we call a multi field search here i can enter for example the address <coughs> of ptv uh, maybe not needed the house number on top then I can perform the geocoding, then I get the hit, I can display it on a map. What you see then is the exact hit of this address. <clears throat> so this is, as I said, a collection of small apps, introducing a decider into the capabilities of PTV, for example. What is quite important in these showcases, what I recommend you to take a look at, is the rendering showcases. Here you can have access also into the quality of data for example every once in a while we get asked what is the coverage of, a, of our map data in some countries outside Europe you may know that PTV is located in Germany in Europe but some of you might deal outside of Europe and then the question is what is the coverage of our data for example in the US if you zoom in then you can have a um, <clears throat> you can check what the data is that we have and also some additional data for example what we call truck attributes quite important in our business for example you can see that there's some weight restrictions height restrictions or some other legal constraints that prevent a truck to drive from driving into such a region or through a specific street which is uh, one of our most important well-known features over the years so this is why i recommend the rendering showcase there's also some showcases about routing from one address to another <clears throat> So here we are, and what's it? Calculate the route. Here we go. Then you see the route on the map. By the way, this mapping interface is 
supported by uh, Leaflet, which is a JavaScript library. Feel free to take a look at Leaflet. Uh, if your decider is uh, interested in you to create an integration, then you can have a look, for example, into the integration examples. Almost same structure, same module references. Well, how can you create a geocoding? For example, this is the single field geocoding example. You can find JavaScript examples here. <clears throat> but JavaScript is not the only language that is supported, as I've mentioned before. These are the integration samples. Here, finally, we have the abstract definition of the interfaces as a whole. So here you have a list of all the modules within a module. You have a list of all the operations. And if we look, for example, into the operation of the geocoding module, <clears throat> here's the search locations request. Whenever something is highlighted, that means you can navigate through more details of one of these classes, for example, the search locations request. If we look into the search locations request, you can see that it is derived by a, a base class that is very important, the so-called request base. I will come back to that in a few seconds. But it also tells you that there is three derived classes. This class is a request for performing a structured input geocoding, as you have seen a few minutes ago. This, the third one is the single field search, where you provide just one single text property to parameterize your search. And the one in the center is the what we call reverse geocoding. Here you provide a coordinate and we tell you what is the address that is nearby this coordinate. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said, you can navigate from a specific class to its subclasses or derived classes and also the other way around. If we look into this base class, request base, you see that this class is used by many, many other classes. <clears throat> That's quite important to know and quite often it's overseen. With this request base class, you can parameterize a lot of very important parameters, especially for routing. If you look into this class, for example, you see that there is a stored profile property. In the stored profile property, you can specify a name of one of those files that you've just seen a few minutes ago <clears throat> that contain, for example, the speed values. Let me just go back to, oops, configuration files. Let's say here's the preset of the routing profile of a delivery vehicle, <clears throat> different speed values, number of tires. This all is used when we perform a routing. <clears throat> okay, I need to speed up a little bit. <clears throat> um, um, <clears throat> client classes is what we've already seen. That's what we've already seen. That's the forum I've already mentioned. I will come back to that later. Once again, about the base class. If you want to parameterize, for example, a routing, uh, here it is, <clears throat> with the regular routing request, you provide a set of coordinates to create so-called waypoints, let's say on-road waypoints, each one of them with X and Y coordinates. <clears throat> Furthermore, you can provide some specific options that have an influence on how we create the best route. For example, how we determine the emission, if you want to report emission calculation based on Habifa or any other well-known standards, or you can activate toll options, <clears throat> you can restrict, you can add working hours, for example, which is the, the is, which is required if you are computing, if you want the, the, the routing engine to consider official driving time or working time regulations, um, <clears throat> then you can do this through the routing options. And finally, in this routing request, you can specify which potential elements of a result you would like to get. These are many Boolean parameters you can just activate or deactivate to ask for the polyline of a routing polygon so you can visualize it on a map afterwards or whether you want to have the emission, whether you want to create a <coughs> um, tour report, for example, that's available here. But what is not obvious, and this is why I tell it, 
is that if you want to parameterize the routing, the, the vehicle's uh, properties like physical dimensions, then you have to navigate to the request base. And then you have to take a look into the request profile. And over there, you can use the vehicle profile as a sub element. And here you find all these physical dimensions, for example, that you can use to describe your uh, truck. <clears throat> Okay, so much about this. Um, we've seen this. Oh, there's one more thing that could be helpful. That's the so-called raw request runner. If you look into the administration section again, here you can see the raw request runner. <clears throat> here you can choose one out of the different modules. For example, the X locate module. You can choose which protocol you would like to use which version of the API you would like to use, which method of the API you would like to use. And then on the right side, there is, for example, a filter icon. If you click on this, you get a set of samples of templates that you can use. Let me just choose this one. That's a single field, no, a, a structured multi-field geocoding and one parameter is available here. I want to know the, I want to get the, country property as an ISO 3 code, for example. So that's something I can parameterize. Let me try this with name <coughs> instead. That's wrong. <laughs> then let me just use another example. So this is München. <coughs> And then we see <clears throat> this is the Italian translation of Munich. If I ask for it in English, then I would get Munich. And if I do not specify that parameter at all, it should just return the German version München, <clears throat> for example. So this is where you can play with. Sometimes when you're in touch with us and you're facing an error, we kindly ask you to provide your messages that have been exchanged with the service. Then we can reproduce your situations by using the raw request runner, for example. <clears throat> so let me get back to the slides. That was the raw request runner. So next thing is, I have already shown you that you can navigate from a class to its base class or to its derived classes. I have already mentioned the importance of the request base class and how you can identify a specific experimental feature in the <clears throat> in the documentation once again here you can see this feature has been improved uh, implemented in version 2.4 still experimental um, <clears throat> it will be available as a, a regular feature in one of the upcoming versions for sure so next thing I would like to show you is some other documents that are available in the web. For example, we have them. Oh, come on. So these are additional resources where you can find information. For example, we have a developer blog that is provided by our product management. In this uh, blog, you can find information about, for example, announcements of webinars. You can get information about new versions that have been released. We have uh, <clears throat> also information about data updates on the cloud, for example, that we have provided Belgium toll updates. You can subscribe this blog here, and then you get notification whenever product management has something to communicate about uh, important use. Next thing is the forum. I have already draw, uh, shown you this container. The forum is public, so each one of you can have access to this to read what is uh, described in the forum. We have different kind of um, containers for subcategories. For example, there is the InfoStream forum where you can get information about something like what are the webinars we provide in the future, uh, what are the webinars that have already been provided in the past? That's something I recommend to you if you want to have a look into these webinars every once in a while. You can find information here in this specific post. If you want to get notified about news, new webinars, for example, I recommend that you register for a login and then once you're logged in, 
here again, then you can subscribe to a whole category such as InfoStream, for example, here's the subscribe, unsubscribe button, or if you don't want to get too many mails, <clears throat> just go into a specific topic like the webinars and then subscribe the webinars. That means whenever I or somebody else writes a response to this specific thread, you will get a notification email uh, for this. <clears throat> so then we've got some uh, backend modules for each one of the, uh, well, X cluster service, X data service, X DEMA service, and so on for all these functional expert modules. We've got technology driven modules such as xserver.net or Xserver web clients based on Ajax, Leaflet, and whatever. <clears throat> so if you have a, if you need a, an example, for example, of, uh, for how to use, how to create a selection feature in a, in a map control, then you can ask the question here or maybe look into this container whether there is already an example. Uh, you can also look for error messages, for example, uh, <clears throat> in, in this. Uh, container and uh, the next category I would like to talk about is the X server internet and the X server administration. These two categories can be used if you have let's say connection problems with X server internet. If uh, your token is expired for example then you can find information what you have to do to get a, a new token or <clears throat> some other uh, stuff. And for those of you who decide to use X servers on premise, I recommend to subscribe the administration forum. Here you can find some kickoff info, but also basics for admins, for example. All these posts that are labeled with a exclamation mark are sticky. That means they remain on top. And here is where you can find important information for administrators. So then we've got some other products like our PTV navigation, uh, offline navigation. So this is available both for Android and for <clears throat> iOS. You can get a trial version of this. Uh, just read this post, for example, and then you can see in the Google store that this is an application you can install in your mobile device, download the map and then get familiar with it. If you want to use it, then just get back to our sales and some other services we offer besides that is driving the arrive that's a developer api that is especially for the determination of uh, arrival times of tour their own device uh, android device <clears throat> the device communicates your current position to this cloud service and the cloud service knows how to determine the potential arrival time considering live traffic information or other uh, sources like historic information. So much about the almost uh, so much about the forum. Finally, I would like to mention that we also have um, a specific sub forum for SAP environments or SAP users. This is mainly responded by <coughs> external parties, not by PTV themselves. Most other forums are moderated by PTV. So external party asks a question, PTV gives the response. And here in the SAP container, it's external parties who give responses usually. <clears throat> I need to drink a zip. Finally, there's also a YouTube channel where you can find different um, <clears throat> recordings of previous webinars or also in uh, I'm, I'm providing recordings in German and English language. Some of them are quite long as yesterday's webinar, almost two hours. <clears throat> Some of them are uh, short, let's say, uh, examples for how to uh, demonstrate a specific feature. This was during the, the peak of the Corona crisis. I created a little recording of a demonstration of the <clears throat> content update service, which uh, provides live traffic information. So feel free to have a look into uh, this YouTube channel. If you want to recommend other topics, just let me know and then I will try to create videos and put them on this channel as well. So much about these documents. <clears throat> and 
next step is user name and token has already been mentioned. Let me just give you some more information about this. If you are implementing an application for your own purpose, for example, you are a transport logistics company and you have a, a development department, then you're treated as a customer. You are acquiring a PTB license for production application. <clears throat> that means you get during the in, uh, development phase you get a test token and at a later stage you get a production token then you're treated as a customer another business model we support is the partner model that means you are creating an application that you are then selling to other parties then you are treated as a partner within the ptv scope um, what also happens is that uh, somebody who is acquired his own license but has no development team hires you as a integrator within the scope of a project and then you are also treated as a partner the reason why i mentioned this difference is because partners will get access to specific additional resources for example a partner can get a <clears throat> pre-sales token this is a token that gives you access to the production environment and then you can use it when you go on a pre-sale session with your potential uh, users with your prospects and show them the quality of an output on the which is produced on a production environment <clears throat> so much about these different tokens test token when you start integrating production token when you have licensed by yourself partner user token is when you have sold the application to an external party and then you get an individual end user or partner user token for the con uh, concrete installation and pre-sales is when you want to demonstrate our software towards others. <clears throat> okay, that was the first block with the uh, how to connect to the services and some, some uh, generic information. I see that, uh, let me have a look into the chat. Uh, I am integrating externally using other calls are not working correctly. How can I look? Is there, okay, I think that's a question that could be relevant for Okay, somebody wants to know how you can activate logging of, uh, of requests. Well, this is a feature that, of course, only works if you're working on-premise. Let me just show you my local installation <clears throat> of an X server. Um, or maybe in the meantime, some of my colleagues can give you some answers in the, in the chat as well. So this is my on-premise installation of my X servers. I have various versions on my environment. Here is my X server 2.19. <clears throat> and within the on-premise version, you in, you're configuring a server by editing the xserver.conf file. If we have a look into this file, So this is the central, uh, the, the, the most important file that is contains, for example, where the map data is stored in your local environment and some parameters that are relevant for creating the log files in a proper way is this one. <clears throat> um, probably the default setting, um, you can set it to fatal, false true or exceptional and for example if you set it to exceptional <clears throat> and start your service uh, on the on the local environment then we will write down the messages that have been exchanged with the service in a regular log file which is available in your local logs folder <clears throat> So this is, maybe that's the information that you would like to see <clears throat> in, in this context, if not just uh, add the question or refine your question in the chat. That's how, just how under, I understood it. If you want to trace messages um, <clears throat> when communicating with X server internet, then it's more complicated. Then you need to add uh, another software like, uh, for example, the, what is it? the Fiddler tool, which is uh, free for download, and then you might trace uh, your local communication. <clears throat> okay, I will go on with 
the presentation if there is no further question to be forwarded to me. Now I want to go a bit more technically into a specific mechanisms. For example, one mechanism that is the, called the, the jobs. <clears throat> um, imagine a situation, one of our, our features that we offer is the bulk geocoding. You can call a method that is called search by address bulk request. The signature of that method is it expects an array of addresses, multi-structured addresses, and an optional parameter for the search options. Let's say you are not providing just five addresses, which could be handled by a backend service within a few milliseconds. Let's say you provide thousands of addresses. <clears throat> Let me give you an, uh, a demonstration about this. This is a test interface I have created some weeks ago. <clears throat> and one of the things I would like to demonstrate is, is now I'm loading 200 addresses from a text file. Here we go, bulk geocoding. <clears throat> so it takes some time to produce all these addresses. What happens right now is that my application starts a job. Here you can see a specific cryptic string. <clears throat> a few seconds it will be done, then I will go back to the slides. So after 20, 25 seconds, uh, <clears throat> I have produced this output, the geocoding of these 200 addresses. You can also visualize it in the different quality levels of these addresses. So, but what happened in these 20 seconds? Instead of sending one request and then waiting for the final result being to be available, I have used an asynchron protocol, an asynchron method. So I was calling a method that is almost labeled in the same way as the one that is mentioned on top. I have started a job with the same parameters, an array of addresses and the search options. What I get back from this method in a few, within a few milliseconds is a, a simple job ID. That's the cryptic string you have seen. And with that job ID, I can ask for what is the current status of this job? So I can ask for, <clears throat> is it still running? Is it still in the queue? Is it terminated successful or with an error message, for example? And this is something I can do in a while loop. So I'm asking for this status using the watch method of a service. <clears throat> and once the status of the, the output of the watch call is succeeded or failed or deleted or unknown, then I can proceed. Then, I do, then the server is done with his job. He can, he's no, no longer computing within that transaction. So I have to ask for the result. And that's what I do with another method, which is called the fetch method. I have to fetch the response mentioning the job ID once it has succeeded, termina uh, terminated successful. <clears throat> Okay, let's have a look into the different potential status values. There are seven of them. The ones that are labeled in yellow mean that the service is still doing something with this kind of transaction. So first of all, when you are entering a server, you are in the queue. Once you have reached to, uh, managed to, to leave the queue, you are in the running uh, mode. And if you trigger a specific method from, from a site, you can even well, uh, stop that service. The regular procedure is queuing, then running, and once you're done with running, you end up successful in succeeded mode. Succeeded means the server is no longer computing. Once you're succeeded, you can fetch the response. If you are failed, deleted, or unknown, you have to implement whatever you would like to do in this case. Failed could also mean to fetch the response and just get the exception that you might need <clears throat> to get access to this. So why is this helpful. What is the difference uh, between the synchron call of a specific method and waiting for 20 seconds without any feedback and using the asynchronous call with intermediate feedback? You will not get access to the partial results with that method, but you get information about the progress. Let's say I do not use <clears throat> um, 200, but 2000 of these addresses uh, I have used in my bulk geocoding example. Then you can ask for a current status, 1%, 2%, 3%. You can determine how much time do I still have to wait for the final result to be available, for example. <clears throat> and that's why you need, that's one reason why you need to take a look at the asynchron communication uh, approach. The other reason why I recommend to have a look at this protocol is because in the cloud, in the Azure cloud, <clears throat> uh, 
um, an HTTP connection is disconnected after three or four minutes. So if you want to compute something which requires 10 minutes, 20 minutes, two hours, then you will not be successful at all with a standard call. <clears throat> then you need to perform an asynchronous call. That's why it is so important. And the, the timeout is not in the hands of PTV. The timeout is defined by Microsoft Azure. And this is why you might have a look at the, the asynchronous methods. I have just made a list of how many methods are available in the different backend modules on this asynchronous protocols. <clears throat> and in the meantime, maybe it's still computing. We go just 50 percent so you can see this could take three four five minutes i have already spent one minute and i'm still waiting for the response <clears throat> any no we will get back to this later <clears throat> so next topic i would like to like to talk about is the so-called stored profile versus request profile you have seen it uh, half an hour ago when i was introducing you into the request based class um, <clears throat> Let's just go back to that again. Request base. <clears throat> As I said, this is a very central, a very important base class. And here you can specify, refer to a stored profile or a request profile. Um, <clears throat> with this base class, you can overwrite, for example, the coordinate format nowadays. WGS84 is the de facto standard. You can provide latitude and longitude as double values with 40 degrees, six degrees or whatever in decimal degrees. <clears throat> you can parameterize that you would like to get the response in a specific geometry style. We support plain KML, um, well-known binaries and well-known texts. And depending on which format you use, you can have, uh, you can use other um, libraries to process the response geometries for visualizing them on a map, for example. And furthermore, you can also <clears throat> overwrite all the optional parameters that are in a server stored profile by using the request profile. <clears throat> Most important uh, sub profiles that you could overwrite is the vehicle profile, which contains the physical dimensions of your truck. You can override the routing profiles, which contains information about parameterizing the algorithm of the routing. And finally, there's also some more sub <coughs> subcategories of um, profiles that you could override. So much about the request profile. Let me go on to the three levels of routing. The, more, the easiest approach of routing is you give us a set of waypoints, let's say, you're located in position A, you want to drive to location Bravo, then to position Charlie, and finally you want to get back to position Alpha. <clears throat> That's a simple sequencing. You send us the coordinates in this sequence. We do not change the sequence at all. We just compute the best way from A to B, from B to C, from C to A, and then return the KPIs, driving time, driving distance, some other values like the toll or period. <clears throat> Uh, additional information such as the polygon, for example, or some file that is called BCR file. Let me just draw your attention to this for a second. Here we go. We can also return a string that looks like this. This is an input file you can forward to our navigation and that will push the driver to follow this route you have created on your backend system, for example. That's another additional output. <clears throat> the, this is a standard routing. As I said, the sequence of the stops is not changed. The next level is a simple sequencing. Once again, you provide the coordinates of A, B, and C, but we are asked to determine where to position B and C, for example, between the, the two uh, alphas between, on, on, during the trip of a day, for example. That's a simple sequencing. In this context, we only consider a single vehicle at the time. Um, this is a simple sequencing. And finally, we've got the highest level of complexity. That's the tour optimization. With tour optimization, you provide a set of trucks, you provide a set of stops you want to visit, so-called orders, and we determine which truck takes care of which orders in what sequence. <clears throat> so that's tour optimization. And we, in, with, 
within this context, we are dealing with uh, three different uh, major categories of restrictions. For example, you can specify the amount of pallets that you can carry with your vehicles. Uh, on the other hand, each order tells you how many pallets are part of the order. Then we make sure that we do not overload the vehicle. Second thing is that you can specify time slots both for the vehicle and the driver <clears throat> and also for the opening times of the stops you would like to visit. And the third uh, level, third category of constraints is the skills. For example, some of your drivers or some of your trucks have a specific set of skills that could be required if you want to take care of a specific order. That's the three major categories we support. So in this context, you can plan your optimal tour from scratch. So you provide all the orders, all the trucks, and we determine the assignments and the sequences. Next approach is that your dispatcher produces something manually. So you maybe you create a mapping front end. The dispatcher is dragging and dropping uh, orders to trucks, um, <clears throat> moving stations or assignments of stations in the map front end. But we let you know what is the the best sequence or what is the consequences for your um, manually as created sequence. We have a proposal function. So that means, for example, you have 10 trucks which uh, are available during the day. You have one new order. You want to know what happens if truck number one takes care of this order, what happens if truck number two takes care of this order, what is the additional distances for these resources, and that's what we call a proposal function. And the fourth version is that you're performing already a, a, a trip in an execution phase. The trucks are already on the road. <clears throat> and then we call, we call this a, an ex, a replanning during an, an execution. <clears throat> so much about the different levels of routing. So <clears throat> OK, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, let me just have a quick glance at them. <clears> the <throat> first question is, how much does it take for Xtour to calculate the fastest route between, let's say, 10 waypoints in sequencing for one truck? Well, to perform this action, you need to do two things. The first uh, task you have to fulfill is to create what we call a distance matrix. That's an object that computes the driving times and driving distances from all your 10 waypoints to all your 10 waypoints. And the distance matrix of that size could be handled within, it depends on whether you can apply um, high performance routing or not. That's a specific mechanism. If you apply high performance routing, we can handle this distance matrix calculation within a few milliseconds. And the next thing is, then you apply the sequence optimization of the 10 stops. And I would say 10 stops is three, two seconds doesn't take more time than this once the distance matrix is available. <clears throat> and I, I hand over this, this, the questions to the, to the chatting team. I hope you can give us some answers. If not, I will have to come back later when I'm done with the logical block. So routing. <clears throat> once again, routing. Routing itself is the term we use when we calculate the best path from one coordinates to another coordinates. <clears throat> and this is done. First, we need to connect the coordinates to the street network. This is a step number one. That's what we call the linking. If the linking was successful for all the coordinates in the input, then we do the real complicated routing algorithm. First, during this algorithm, we are filtering all the segments that are not relevant. Let me just show you a little video. <clears throat> Just a second. Here it is. <clears throat> so what you see in the next seconds is how we create temporary data structures. So uh, what you and I, what every person usually does when we perform a long distance route is we try to 
well, let's say I, I drive from from Munich in the in the south of Germany to Hamburg in the north of Germany, six seven hundred kilometers of distance. The first thing I do in the region of Munich is I want to, I try to reach the high network, the the highways, the the major roads. Then I'm moving from the region of Munich to the region of let's say. Well, let's say the other way around. This is Hamburg, this is Munich. So if I want to drive from Hamburg to Munich, I try to reach the, <coughs> the upper classes network. And then I am creating data structures, flooding uh, the, the network of the streets that are available nearby until I finally reach the destination region. And over there, I try to find smaller roads to to reach my destination, which is based in the inner city of somewhere in, in Munich, for example. So this is how we create data structures. <clears throat> and for this, we are performing what we call leveling. So we are removing any segment that is too far, uh, that is of a lower class and that is too far away from any involved um, <clears throat> waypoint. In the next thing, what we do is we compute some initial costs of these segments. The initial costs of a segment are determined by the driving time and driving distance that is uh, required on such a segment. <clears throat> and once we have this initial costs, we will multiply the initial costs with a, with a factor in, in some cases, for example, if the, uh, the segment belongs to a specific category you would like to avoid, then we just add, oops, <clears throat> then we just add some uh, other costs on the initial price of the segment. <clears throat> and finally, once we have determined the sequence of segments which connect the two waypoints with the lowest amount of costs, <clears throat> and then we, we, then we, at that point in time, we know the driving time and driving distance. And once we are done with the routing process. If needed, we can also apply further reporting functions like creation of maneuver list or uh, creation computation of emission or creation of the toll in detail, for example. So <clears throat> that's uh, about routing in general. The next thing I would like to show you is the combination of what we call time consideration and um, <clears throat> additional data we can provide. Let me go back to the browser to the showcases. <clears throat> and let's just have a look into the rendering showcase. Here we are. Let's have a look at the feature layer showcase or time dependent feature layer showcase. On the left side, you can see several optional uh, data containers like the truck attributes or the live traffic incidents. These are updated every three minutes. <clears throat> and here I can also specify a specific so-called time consideration mode. For example, I only want to show restrictions from one out of these two categories that apply on a specific time of the day. And you can specify a time consideration mode in combination with a specific reference time. For example, these are the blockings that apply right now, 3 p.m., <clears throat> um, based on the regular settings and the traffic incidents. Let me go to another region in where I live here in, in Karlsruhe. If I zoom closer to <clears throat> this uh, part of the city, here we can see traffic incident contributions, but also truck attributes. And here, here you can see the region around the hospital of Karlsruhe. In this region where the gray segments are <clears throat> displayed, you're not allowed to drive during the night. <clears throat> so if I create a map of 8 p.m. <clears throat> with a snapshot time consideration mode, that means uh, the, the map shows me that I'm not allowed to drive here due to some of these restrictions. And you can use the same restrictions also in the routing. <clears throat> um, so when you apply a time consideration snapshot in a routing call, then we will perform a detour not driving through this region if 
the snapshot is at the same state as you can see it right now. <clears throat> so this uh, time-dependent consideration or the time-dependent status of a segment can be applied when you use truck attributes, when you use live traffic information or historical information. <clears throat> and um, so there could be complete blockings of street segments if there is a, a really heavy traffic accident, for example, or if you're not allowed to drive during the night on a specific segment, or it could be just have an impact on a reducing of speed. That means in the data, <laughs> Sorry, for example, in case of a traffic incident, um, that we let you know that there is a, a reduction of the speed on that segment, which could lead to just additional driving time on the same track that you would drive without a traffic accident. It could also lead to us creating a detour around these kind of segments. <clears throat> so um, it is important for you to understand that we determined the temporary context of a segment in a way that, a, that we check when do we pass a segment. And that is, now it's time to get back to the video we've already seen. What we can also do is when we flood the street network in the way that you see right now, whenever a green segment is evaluated, we know the time context of when we pass that segment. <clears throat> and with the time context that we have determined, we can uh, determine, we can also determine the situation, the conditions of that segment at that point in time, whether it's blocked or whether it's reduced or whether it's free flow or, uh, and so on. So the different time considerations modes we have is, for example, well, the exact time consideration at start. Let me give you an example with my test client. Here I'm specifying that I'm leaving. This is the, the route from Karlsruhe to Mannheim. I'm specifying I want to consider the traffic incidents and let's say truck speed patterns and truck attributes. And I want to leave Karlsruhe at midnight. Here we go. I have set uh, the time consideration mode parameter to exact at start. What happens is that the algorithm is <clears throat> determining flooding the street network, as you've seen in the other video, from here determining what is the situation on the streets uh, at specific point in time. Um, and here in this list of the detailed segments, you can see that <clears throat> on these segments we have let's say free flow speed conditions, I can drive very fast. That's not really surprising because I started the trip during the night. And here you see additional information. There is also some tra traffic incidents on this route. Most important example here is the track is 65 kilometers in length and it requires about 56 minutes during the night. Now let's change the scope to <clears throat> somewhere in the morning once again. Probably it's the same track, but it will have not 56 minutes, but way more time. It takes even up to 30 minutes more, and it also takes a different track. Reason for this is usually in the morning, you will have traffic jams somewhere here in that region. That's the headquarter of SAP, and uh, they produce a lot of traffic here in that region. So that's where you provide when you are leaving your start position. We can also do the opposite. You can also specify when you want to arrive at your destination and then we do the flooding of the street network in the other way around. So this is, let's say, if I'm driving from, if I want to drive from Munich, which is the red pin, to Hamburg and I want to arrive at a specific point in time, then the algorithm has to flood the street network from the destination towards the start in the reverse order. <clears throat> so these are the, this is the difference between uh, consideration at start and consideration at arrival. We have some more time consideration modes. I'm running out of time a little bit, so I'm giving, uh, I'm speeding up. <clears throat> so we have optimistic consideration, which just means that we do only uh, consider segments that are, or segment attributes that are 
independent from time, which is typically the case for maximum weight values on bridges, maximum height values on tunnels, for example. And we do not consider uh, segment restrictions that are time dependent, like the uh, scenario around the hospital of Karlsruhe, where you are only restricted during the night, for example. Finally, we have a time span consideration mode. This one is important if you want to compute a route, for example, in the future, in two or three days, and you do not want to consider live traffic, uh, which is based on uh, traffic uh, on accidents, which will be cleaned up after a few uh, minutes or hours, but you still want to consider long-term constructions. Then you can use the time span mode. And the, finally, the multiple travel times mode is relevant, uh, especially if you're um, <clears throat> if you want to apply a distance matrix. Then you, we can create the distance matrix. Here you can see different length of the bars. Let me show you on one of the examples on the showcases. Here's the routing showcase. Here is the multiple travel time DEMA. This might take some time. <clears throat> it's now calculating the driving times and driving distance from each one of these gray positions to each one of the gray positions. And this is, hap this is also considering the additional data containers, the truck attributes, the speed patterns, and the traffic incidents over a period of 24 hours. <clears throat> so. We have now calculated the driving time and driving distance, for example. Still calculating. <clears throat> so this is now calculating the driving time and driving distance from this coordinate to this coordinate. And depending on whether it's midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, and so on, it will determine different driving dis, uh, sorry, driving times during the day. That's a multiple travel time consideration mode. <clears throat> okay, let me have a quick glance at the chat. <clears throat> Somebody is asking, I have a route from Germany to Norway. I would like to show two routes, one via the road system and one using the ferry. Could you explain how a scenario like this can be achieved Thank you. Okay, let me try this on a map. <clears throat> Let's say Germany. <clears throat> I will calculate the route from Hamburg to <clears throat> Oslo. So, <clears throat> and I'm choosing a regular default profile with the, all the other parameters set in a regular way. <clears throat> Let me just remove these additional things. They have an impact on the performance too much now for a demo. So <clears throat> I have used standard settings and one of the standard settings is for example that ferries get an additional discount of 100%. I will remove that discount. I will even set it to prefer ferries, for example. <clears throat> and then it creates a different geometry. <clears throat> what I did for this is I used the vehicle profile, uh, sorry, the, the request profile in the services, X route operations, route request. And there we've got the, sorry, routing request. We've got the request base. Within the request base, I have overridden the request profile. <laughs> more, to be more precise, it was the routing profile setting. And here I have the curse. <clears throat> Within curse, I have combined transport settings. And here we've got it. Here is a parameter that I can use. I only changed one single parameter. That was the boat penalty. I set it to a negative value to make ferries be more attractive. Usually <clears throat> yeah, 
you apply positive integer or double values and that means you want to avoid something. <clears throat> so the default value for this parameter is 100 and that's when, when I apply the default value of 100 then I will take this route which is using only a small ferry <clears throat> but if you allow us to use uh, ferries without a, speci a specific uh, handling then we can just set it to vote penalty of 0%. Another question. <clears throat> Okay, there is one, some more questions in the in the chat that are dealing with the distance matrices. Uh, I would like to forward that topic to a webinar I'm providing next week. Then I will introduce you just into the subtopic of how to work with XDEMA. So I, I really recommend to do this. Um, <clears throat> and this will be an English ver uh, version of a webinar, by the way. Let me scan this. Or let me give you an, uh, an example for the speed of the distance matrix calculation under specific circumstances. <clears throat> so what you see right now is a list of specific routing profiles that have an incredible, incredibly fast performance when it comes to distance matrix calculation. So let me use, for example, this uh, identifier and then create a distance matrix. <clears throat> But that's in detail, I will show this in the webinar next week. <clears throat> and then I will load some sample data into my memory. <clears throat> Here we go, I have just loaded several thousand coordinates. Well, that's a problem in the application, I think. <clears throat> Let me just trigger it. <clears throat> so now I have triggered a distance matrix calculation of several thousand X and Y coordinates in square. <clears throat> For example, we can handle let me show this in the forum. <clears throat> I have some statistics in the forum about how much time it takes to create a distance matrix if the preconditions are set. <clears throat> we can create a 500 in square distance matrix in just one second or 1000 in square in just two seconds. So I have chosen about 10,000s, I think, in the sample for a percent. <clears throat> And it will take about one minute to compute millions of relations with this extremely fast mechanism. But that's part of the webinar next week. I'm having a look at some other comments in the chat. Is there an option to in the routing system to draw a route between two points that minimizes the GHG emissions for a specific type of vehicle? Um, <clears throat> I would say nope. What we do, uh, that's why I explained the, the, the three steps of linking, routing and uh, listing, the emission calculation is done after we have determined the track. So we cannot use this as an optimization goal for uh, the proper route. Okay, we have some other questions about tour optimization. Uh, I hope the colleagues can give you answers about this. It's a bit off, not, I wouldn't say off topic today, but <clears throat> too, too use case driven. Uh, in the meantime, I will proceed with some other slides explaining the different containers that we have already, some of them uh, we have already seen in the, in the uh, browser. <clears throat> So these are the, we've been talking about the truck attributes. I'm once again using the rendering examples. <clears throat> so let me apply the snapshot. The truck attributes is legal restrictions, height restrictions, weight restrictions, uh, forbidden because of uh, hazardous goods, for example. That's part of this 
additional container, then we've got the speed patterns. What you see in the map right now is the historical situation on the street network on a average Wednesday at 3 p.m. For example, you see some of the highways are in green. They have a comparably good free flow mode and other highways like the ones here are red or orange. That means there is some kind of workload the, of utilization on these segments. That's the historical information. So we have 24 hours per day, seven days per week, which means 168 different conditions <clears throat> on these street segments that are part of the data, which is aggregated over a time of two years. So that means we have just a statistical Friday, just a statistical Wednesday and the times during the day. Next category is the live traffic incidents, updated every three minutes. And uh, that contains both long-term constructions, but also short-term incidents. And the next category is the general truck restrictions. These are weekend lorry bans that apply in, let's say, usually countrywide. If I zoom out in the in the map, <clears throat> you see different gray areas in the various countries. Wherever we have a gray area, that means there could be some weekend lorry ban. But remember, the time span, oh, uh, sorry, the snapshot, the time consideration mode, reference time is a Wednesday. And on Wednesday, these blockings do not apply. Let me move in time. Let me move closer to the weekend, Friday. <clears throat> Friday afternoon, there is a lorry ban in Italy. Um, <clears throat> if I move to Saturday, some more countries are red, like Switzerland, Austria, and France. <clears throat> and if I move to Sunday, then also Poland is blocked, for example. These are general truck restrictions. So example, for example, if I try to calculate a route um, starting from Madrid, to uh, Prague on a Friday afternoon, we might have a, oh, well, let's say, uh, we might have to apply a break here at the border to wait until we're allowed to drive on, to move on. <clears throat> so these are general truck restrictions. Truck attributes, we've already done. General truck restriction, done. Traffic incidents, done. Speed patterns, done. And you know, we also have restriction zones or preferred routes. That's not part of this use case. Let me use that one again. <clears throat> Here's the restriction zones and preferred routes. I have to move out. As far as I know, they do not depend on the time of the day. <clears throat> so we will see them in the region of Munich. I expected that to be... <clears throat> Preferred routes around Munich as well. Surprise, surprise, surprise. I have seen them this afternoon. By the way, my distance matrix is now done. After three minutes, I have calculated the large distance metrics. I come back to this in a few seconds. Let me just use the mapping interface to show you the restriction zones. <clears throat> and the preferred routes. Here we go. These two categories, the, re the restriction zones, will prevent you from driving into the inner city of that region if you are not a delivery truck. And on the other hand, the blue Polygon shows a preferred route. That means if you are driving from, let's say, the south of Munich to the region north of Munich, we will direct you on this preferred routes around <clears throat> that all uh, around the inner city of Munich, for example. This is also additional containers. Okay, so much about the additional containers. Next topic I would like to talk about is the break and rest rules. This is important if you, especially if you're performing uh, long distance routing. So in this context, you would like our engine to add additional stops during the route. After a specific amount of time of driving or working, you are supposed to have a break, a shift break or whatever, and we support different uh, kinds of break and rest rules. 
in Xserver 1. <clears throat> um, this was also available, but with a specific limitation, you were not able to specify a driver's history. This is now possible in Xserver 2 in the current version of our API. You can specify how much time the driver has been driving right before he starts the new route. <clears throat> and that means depending on the, the budget he's, he still has, we will add an early break um, at the beginning of his route, for example. Let me show you how this looks like with the routing example. <clears throat> I think this is a good example for the for the long distance. We have uh, several hundred kilometers, quite a long time. I'm applying the working directive. Now I'm applying the European driving time directive, and I'm also requesting additional tour maneuvers. Let me also add, ask for this. <clears throat> And now on this route, we will see, we should see some additional elements in the tour list. So if we look close into our map, we see that some of these elements here, these are regular maneuvers. Um, here, for example, this is a tour event. After a specific amount of driving, in this case, four and a half hours, we will perform our first regular driving break of 45 minutes, for example, at that position. Then we move on on that road. <clears throat> Here's the next break, I think. Here's the next tour event. <clears throat> um, again, 45 minutes break over there. And that's something we can just add on top of this. And one other difference compared to X server one is this also works in this interface in combination with the uh, truck speed patterns and truck attributes, so the time-dependent layers, <clears throat> which is a big benefit compared to XServer 1. So next category of information I would like to talk about is the result fields. So uh, when you perform a routing, you can ask the service to provide different optional result elements, for example, the, t the toll, the, the different turning informations uh, from station between stations or uh, the driving events or tour events I've just shown or border crossings, for example. We can report emissions based on different standards. We can return <clears throat> the guided navigation string that you can use as an input for the um, navigation for the mobile device. And we also support a new mode of calculation uh, of cal calculating the best path on a route, we can also perform the optimal route based on a combination of the existing toll prices, uh, tariff you define through the API, costs per kilometer, costs per millets of driving, and uh, also cost per speed. <clears throat> and uh, so this is what you can get as an output. What is important in terms of performance is that you only ask for those information elements in the response that you really want to use. Otherwise, you produce additional network traffic and you produce additional calculation efforts on the server, which would not be needed <clears throat> to be considered. So <clears throat> next topic, I already spoke about having a distance matrix webinar in uh, about one week which is in English language, and I will introduce you into the specific um, methods and parameters of the XDEMA and also into its use cases. It will be a very detailed one. I think we will take about one hour just covering one specific programming module. <clears throat> so you can find information about this in the forum as well. Okay, now it's once again, it's time to log into the chat. Uh, the only question I see so far is, I have a route from Germany to Norway. Well, that's what I have already displayed. Um, are there any further questions? Maybe ask the question to the colleagues in the, in the team. <clears throat> Doesn't look like this so far. Otherwise, just interrupt me. Let me have a look at my test client and maybe demonstrate some more capabilities of the routing engine. For example, I would like to show you the 
short distance example for how we deal with truck attributes if they are value driven. Let me have a look at this specific tunnel and at this street which comes from the north to the south from the Breite Straße to the St. Florian Straße. I will calculate the route from <clears throat> Here we go. <clears throat> oh, that's a, a very big detour. <clears throat> the reason for the detour is that uh, because I'm not allowed to use the, just to say, let me just check one thing first. That's even another route. Because I'm not allowed to use that tunnel because I'm too high. Well, in terms of my height. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look at to the request profile. I know that there is a restriction which is applies for two meters and 60 as far as I know. <clears throat> and once I have set through my API, through my request profile, that the dimension of my truck is only two meters, then I'm allowed to use this truck. So that is a combination that combines <clears throat> the physical dimensions of my truck with the additional data which is part of the truck attributes. If I specify, if we look into the, the segments in the into the output, it's not many segments. Oops. So feel. So then we can see that there is a height restriction which applies above a height of two meters and 60. Let me just try uh, uh, prove this. Request profile, two meters 70, for example. Then we perform the detour. If it's just <clears throat> two meters and 50 centimeters, then it will drive through that specific tunnel. And this is also possible with different freight categories. <clears throat> and uh, like like hazardous goods, for example. So you have to specify this, the properties of your truck. You have to activate so-called truck attributes, and then we will determine where you are allowed to drive and where you are forbidden to drive. <clears throat> okay, yeah, it's time to look into the chat again. Uh... Do you have Navigator component for Android devices? I need to calculate my route, but I want to use my build-in navigation. Okay, thank you, Tobias, for taking care of that question. Probably you can answer it because I can't. <clears throat> I mean, on a rough level, I know that we have this Android application, <clears throat> which is also, once again, let me show you the Navigator forum. Here you can have access to the trial version of the Navigator software. <clears throat> so, any other questions? Well, if not, then I'm coming back to the slides again for a second. We still have some 20 minutes. So if there are further questions in the next minutes, just add them. <clears throat> so as I said, we have some additional PTV services. For example, PTV Drive and Arrive service. That's a JavaScript API where you can um, <clears throat> install an application on your mobile device, which will then provide the current position to a web to our web service and um, <clears throat> if you if you tell us where you want to drive next we can determine the uh, ETA time <clears throat> and uh, you can also forward that information with a notification service to other parties if you want. Next thing is the truck navigator, the offline navigation. There's also an SDK available. I will <clears throat> um, have to forward questions if, you, if you're dealing with this technology. I have to forward the questions to Sebastian. 
<clears throat> then we will provide a fuel price API. That is a feature that is currently still in development within our subsidiary of the colleagues of our data digital services uh, <clears throat> company, which is a, a daughter of the PDB uh, itself, also located here in the headquarter. And with that future API, you can ask for, let's say, give me a, a list of petrol, uh, petrol stations, fuel stations around a specific coordinate, and it also provides the live fuel prices at the moment when you call it. <clears throat> and finally, we also have professional services. So, for example, if you would like to have an individual training, you can ask for an offer, a one-day, two-day, three-day workshop discussing implementing your application together with uh, somebody like me, whether it's me or some colleagues from a subsidiary you're also in touch with, uh, it's uh, <clears throat> something we could easily talk about. And what also happens every once in a while is that a customer uh, asks PTV consultants to produce data. For example, you can send us all your, uh, let's say easiest way, all your addresses, you send us them, uh, you send them to us as a, an Excel sheet and we just, geocode these addresses and send you the list of geocoded addresses back. That's one case for, for this. <clears throat> so then I wanted to give you some additional hints. <clears throat> Let me just come back to my test client that I already used to create a distance matrix. Remember, I have asked for a distance matrix of several thousand locations in a row. I have created the distance matrix. It has taken about three minutes to produce it. This is the idea of the distance matrix that is available in the service. And with another function, I can ask for a list of the distance matrices that are on the service. That's what I will do next. <clears throat> and then it will give me a list of the distance matrices together with uh, some KPIs. So this is the distance matrix I have just created. Let me also ask for start and destination locations only. I will only ask for the <clears throat> start locations. And then you will see that the number of relations in this distance matrix, which took me about three minutes to be computed, is 13,000 in square. So we're talking about 170 million relations which are stored in the distance matrix and it took me about three minutes to compute them. Let me just ask this. Even more than that, 180 million relations that are in this distance matrix and <clears throat> I was in the chapter of functional hints. Remember the sample where I did the, the bulk geocoding? Let me just do it again. There is one parameter which is called allowed countries. Remember, if I am limiting the search for geocodings to a specific country, for example, Poland, it, and I'm dealing with the whole world map, Poland is just 1% or less than 1% of the whole map data of the world. Let me just perform the bulk geocoding again. <clears throat> Here we are, and then you can see that I did the geocoding of about 1,300 addresses, 1,300 addresses within just 20, less than 20 seconds. Here we go. This is a performance topic. If I, it took 15 seconds. If I do not provide. <clears throat> If I do not uh, limit the search space for the geocoding, uh, then it will not take 15 seconds, maybe a minute or even more. Let me just remove that parameter, load the data again. And you see that the speed of the calculation is much slower than in the other example. <clears throat> this will be terminating in the background. Let me go to the next parameter in the meantime. Um, <clears throat> One, one of you asked for, uh, can we consider the, the truck attributes, for example? It's important not only to specify the dimensions of your truck, you also have to combine it with the request for the feature layer truck attributes. Only if both is the case, asking for the feature layer, 
to be considered and the dimensions of your truck, then we will consider this in the routing. Then there is one new feature that is the <clears throat> driving side of a routing. I will show this in a screenshot. <clears throat> so if you look at this, for example, this image computes a route from the green coordinate to the red coordinate. And I have used the new parameter is consider the, the driving direction. And that means the driver drives from green in that direction. He does not arrive here. He's going on, then he takes the roundabout and on his way back on that street, then he's now on the driving side on the correct side of the road. And that's the new parameter. And this will also take effect if you perform optimization, for example, with this parameter, this is a little example for <clears throat> a garbage collection. In this case, with the old parameter setting, we will just cross the street several times. With the new parameter, we will do all the garbage collection on one side of the street, perform the maneuver over there, turn around, and then do all the collection on the other side of the road. <clears throat> So let me have a look into the chat once again. We still have 15 minutes. Link to the next webinar that's coming soon, of course. Can you show us calculating routes for a couple of trucks at once? That's uh, not sure what you mean. You mean tour optimization with a, with a fleet or? <clears throat> yes. Um, I can, there is a showcase in the in the browser available for this, tour planning, plan tours, for example. <clears throat> this is airline based. So whenever I click into the map, this adds a new order into the example. <clears throat> we see that there are different um, <clears throat> tours. And for those who asked how much time does it take, to optimize 20 or 30 stops. As I said, if the distance matrix is already available, <clears throat> then the optimization of such a small problem category is not really a challenge for us. So if you want to do this, you have to take a look at plan tours. That's the X tour service. Here we've got plan tours. Within plan tours, you can specify a set of X and Y coordinates of, uh, of customer locations or your own depot, for example, you can specify a set of orders, for example, bring something from alpha to beta. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you can specify your fleet and then we will apply our tour optimization magic and let you know in the response, tours response, which trucks have to drive which tours in what sequence do they have to deliver their goods or collect their goods and so on. That's part of the X tour service. <clears throat> so it's, I'm, I'm, I'm slowing down now with uh, the presentations. Just want to let you know once again that we have the discussion forum with um, a, an amount of more than 500 users from all over the world. Uh, Usage of the forum is free of cost. You just need to register. Um, it might be the case that I'm sending you an invitation based on what you entered in the forum. If you register, you also can specify whether you're a developer or a decider, um, whether you're using SAP or not. And uh, well, I, I'm using the forum especially for error messages and uh, articles about how you can use a specific new feature, for example. So feel free to subscribe and even to contribute. Another question in the chat. Okay, that's something I have to come back one to one. <clears throat> um, if you have further questions about what you have seen today, just get back to me through this email address visit my channel, maybe you can find something uh, which deals with the topic you have over there. Please also 
subscribe my channel. I mean, that's what you quite often hear during webinars or something like this. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently gathering uh, additional uh, subscribers on this channel and uh, <clears throat> that's it. Um, if you have regular errors, just get back to the technical support team. Some of you have already been in touch with my colleagues. Um, this is the support address of the colleagues who are responsible for the for the headquarter and its customers. <clears throat> um, you should always have a local first contact in the subsidiary, subsidiary you're in touch with, even if a smaller office of PTV somewhere in a country uh, might not have a technical staff, they should be your first contact person for this. <clears throat> and the contact in support, they also take care of topics like regular as standard generic errors or expired tokens for the clouds, for example. <clears throat> and if you have licensing questions, you can also get in touch with the local sales or partner managers. So finally, there's a list of resources <clears throat> like the test environment, a developer forum, um, the developer blog, and uh, some some guidance uh, through our mighty documentations. Um, feel free to make use of these resources. One asked in the quest, one person asked in the chat when the uh, for the registration of the next webinars. That's what you can see in the webinars forum. The the next actions I will provide here will be, so we're done with this week. I will do the aftermath in the next days and provide the YouTube video on the channel. And next webinars I will provide will be the English speaking distance metrics calculation webinar. The German version is already available on YouTube. And the next thing will be a German webinar where I just discuss with some parties about predefined topics like, well, in German, German language, um, <clears throat> break and rest rules in details. The fuel API will be demonstrated by our colleagues in, from the DDS. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that's a new format I will also play with. So we will just spend a, a given budget of time. Uh, for example, for the break and rest rules, just 15, up to 15 minutes discussion between an external party who is available on audio and one of our core developers who is the expert in the specific topic. So if you want, one-to-one -one treatment uh, with sessions with you and your development team. We can establish this, just get in touch with your local consultant, with one of my colleagues who is now in the chat or uh, with the counterparts you have. Sales will also redirect you to specific teams if needed. <clears throat> okay, let me have a look uh, into the chat once again. <clears throat> First, let me once again open this. Oh, thank you for the feedback, positive feedback that I've already read in the in the chat. Uh, the video will, will be available on my YouTube channel, so just look for Bernd Welter PTV on YouTube and you will find it. So, just show this. <clears throat> Here we go. That's my business channel, and here you have all these videos on my channel. And <clears throat> of course, I wish to have more time because there's so many features I would like to demonstrate with these test clients, with these showcases. Um, maybe you can just ask me one-to-one -one afterwards about do you have a, a showcase or a video about a specific feature that I have just mentioned on audio, um, and then I will send you the, the link to that video uh, if, if you want. Use that time. In the next days, I will gather the questions from the chat. I will bring them into a document, uh, merging them with the German and English version, and then send an email to all the participants or registered parties. By the way, even if you registered for a webinar but did not participate, you are on the list of email recipients. Then you will get the documents that I used during the presentation. That's it. <clears throat> okay, so much about this. Uh, I would say thank you for joining today. 
Thank you also to the team who has taken uh, care of your questions in the chat. And I will get back to you in the next days with the detailed responses from the chat and with additional information. It was a pleasure for me. And I hope to see you in one of my next webinars. Thank you very much. And bye. And big, big thumbs up and thank you to the team, Isabel, Oli, Fabio, Julia, Mohammed, Tobias, all of you. Thank you very much for uh, taking care of my back during this session and see you. Bye bye. Oh, well, we still have five minutes. If some more questions. Well, I would say we're done. Thank you.